of the 18 Strong Podcast, episode number 346 with Mike Romatowski from Mach 3 Speed Training. What's up, guys? Welcome back to the 18 Strong Podcast, where we know the stronger we are, the better we play. My name is Jeff Pelizero. I'm your host. And 18 Strong is all about bringing on guests with some sort of experience, expertise, information, or just stories that are going to help all of us finish all 18 Strong. And this week, we have Mike Romatowski on the show. He's the creator and founder of Mach 3 Speed Training, which is a system of speed training tools and ways of, of working out with these tools that are really geared towards enhancing your speed, but also strengthening your body at the same time. So what's cool about Mike's system is that he uses these tools that he developed over the years based on different apparatuses that he saw and worked with in his many years as a fitness trainer and in the, the pre and post rehab setting. And Mike has developed these in order to specifically work with golfers on increasing speed, but at the same time, teaching your body how to get stronger, how to improve your balance and how to do everything that much more efficiently. In fact, the theme of this whole podcast is really how to move more efficiently, how to swing the golf club more effortlessly, but with speed. And you're going to hear him talk about the concept of speed out front and how that really dictates everything that they do in the Mach 3 speed training system. In fact, Mike says that when you understand this concept of speed out front, you are naturally just going to be faster forever, even without using the tools of the Mach 3 speed training. Once you understand the concept of speed out front, you're going to teach your body how to sequence your movements, how to sequence your swing to swing a lot more efficiently and faster, and you're going to start noticing distance gains right there without even swinging the tools. Now, what's cool about this episode is I've had a chance to utilize some of these tools, and I'm using these in what I like to call Operation Lion's Den, which you'll hear more about later on, and if you're following my social media, it's basically me on a journey to get to single digits, but really ultimately to not let my son beat me at golf. My son has become a, a golfer for the freshman golf team here in St. Louis and is really just picking up the game at a more serious level. And it's funny how it just kind of encourages all of us to get a little bit better when we have somebody creeping on our tail. And so Operation Lion's Den is basically a mission for all of us, not just me, but all of us that are out there trying to hold on, whether that be your son, your nephew, your little brother, whoever it is trying to catch up to you, not letting them catch you. So I'm utilizing some of these tools with my coach, Casey Cox, who you heard on the podcast a couple weeks ago, and helping me to learn how to swing more efficiently, but also obviously work on gaining speed and distance because I know this youngster is coming after me and I'm not going to let that happen. So in this episode, we're going to talk about building that effortless speed, building more efficient swings, and how you can do that with this system and really how to do it without having to go spend a bunch of time in the gym, lift a bunch of heavy weights. That's the beauty of Mike's system and what he's created here with Mach 3 Speed. Before we dive into the episode, I want to say thanks to our partners over at Link Soul. Link Soul is our favorite brand of apparel and has been dressing us for the past eight years on the 18 Strong Podcast. You can tell by my hat, by my jacket, we love all of their gear. It's a perfect time for the lightweight jackets getting out on the course. We're starting our mandatory golf Fridays every Friday morning where we get out and it's usually a little bit chilly. We tee time about 6.20 a.m. or so in the morning and it's perfect for the light jacket, the boardwalker shorts, and you know maybe a little hoodie or something like that. So Linksole has us covered and they've got you covered too. If you just go to 18strong.com slash Linksole, you're going to get 20% off of everything that you order in your cart. And I guarantee you're going to be super happy with anything that you put in that cart. We have just about every one of our buddies, all of our relatives wearing Linksol all over the golf course and just in everyday life. And it's kind of funny because them being a West Coast company, they're starting to gain a lot of traction here in the Midwest. And I'd like to say that 18 Strong has done its part to do that. So once again, go to 18strong.com slash Linksol to get your 20% off. Okay, let's jump into our chat with Mike Romatowski. Mike Romatowski, welcome to the 18 Strong Podcast. Oh, thank you. Happy to be here. Oh, it's great to finally have you. I've, I've talked a little bit about the Mach 3 recently because uh, 
As I mentioned to you, I've been working with Casey Cox, uh, the biomechanist that we had on the show a little while ago, and he's a huge fan. And, um, you know, I had, had Jeff on the show I think it was episode 226, um, talking about this with Ken, and gave a little bit of a, a, an intro to the Mach 3 system, but that was several years ago, so I'm really excited to bring yeah. you on and you know, dive into how this whole thing developed and, and how it continues to progress, and uh, so thanks again for joining us. Sure, thank you. So, obviously, uh, many people listening to the show might not know exactly what the Mach 3 system is and i know it's probably a little hard to describe in one succinct a little you know couple of seconds but how would you most simply ex explain it describe it and then we're going to dive in how you kind of came up with the whole concept mm -hmm. basically it's a non-technical golf speed and conditioning program so there is no real study of technique uh, it's very intuitive and it's a way of gaining speed safely and then also training to be in your best shape underneath that so that you can either continue to gain speed in the future or you can at least maintain what you have. I love that. And I love that and we're going to tackle this in a little bit, that it's also not just about speed, but it's about the strength training, but, but very specific to what a golfer needs but also kind of expands outside of just the tee box, just the fairways, allows them to, again, live healthier, be, be stronger. So if you don't mind, give the folks a little bit of your background. I know you have a very extensive background in the fitness and, and rehab and postural world. So if you could, just give us a little synopsis there. Yeah, so basically I come from a fitness background. Um, since 1985, I've been in the world of personal training and then sports conditioning and what's called post rehab, meaning taking somebody who's been through physical therapy already and segueing them back into the game. Since the year 2000, I've only worked with golfers, although we are starting to work with baseball players now, but uh, mainly golfers. I am from Rockville, Maryland area. Uh, so I just by fate, uh, met Greg Rose when he was creating what became TPI. Back then it was called the Body Swing Connection. So just had a really ringside seat to how the body affects the swing. And, and he was my first and still most important educator as to how that happens and why it happens. Uh, so of course, eventually he moved to San Diego and created TPI, which is a worldwide colossus. Uh, but it was just luck for me that I was able to know, know him and work with him as he was creating that. And so since then, I've only worked with golfers. In Maryland, I had what would be probably called more a personal training center. We had multiple trainers, each doing kind of their own specialty, but I was golf. And then when I moved to Texas in 2017 had space available. Uh, we we lucked our way into a big indoor gym, which is basically a, a big open room with a hitting net on one end, and also had access to the junior programs of David Ogren and Mark Caldwell, who are instructors in this area, very successful with juniors. And so we we had outdoor as well as indoor areas. And at a certain point, I thought, you know, speed is the most, most fun thing to train for, mm -hmm. really. And I believe driver is the most important club in the bag. So decided, you know, let's just do that. Let's just do speed. And the, the timing was good, uh, you know, because right about at that time, so let's say it's five years ago, everybody really started understanding where the professional game had gone and the other elite levels, uh, certainly of male elite level competition, so call that Division I College, Corn Ferry, and PGA Tour are very much power and distance games now. LPJ is not exactly that way. They're still a little different. They don't set up the courses to reward the bombers, but still the LPGA has a distance threshold just like every level does. And that's really what we're looking for is you don't have to be the longest hitter out there, but there's a threshold that you have to meet 
if you expect to be highly competitive. So just the, the example of that, if we go straight up to the PGA Tour, uh, if you look at last year, the, the last full season that was played, the, the tour average was 300 yards distance, 299.8, so I'm going to call it 300. If you look at the top 30 money winners, 28 of them averaged 300 or more. If you look at all the tournaments that were played during the year, 88% of them were won by players who averaged 300 or more. Uh, so, so the threshold is very clear on the, on the PGA Tour. If you expect to win or be highly competitive, you really do need to be over 300 average. One guy last year won at 290 and one guy won at 285. Nobody wins less than 285 anymore. And that's just the way it is. That is the game. So corn fairy guys are kind of even longer than PGA Tour guys usually because their courses are set up to bomb it and to, to shoot low scores. Um, and Division One, you know, I can tell you that the Division One players that come in our gym, you you better be club head 120, ball speed 180, or close, or it's going to be difficult. Wow. So um, the speed is the fun part in Mach 3, but we're a very comprehensive conditioning program for the entire game. So underneath the speed is what I would call strength in relevant patterns. So all everything we do is on your feet and pretty much within the basic parameters of the swing. So what I want is for someone to look at Mach 3 from the outside, looking at a workout and say, yeah, I get that. I understand exactly why they're doing that just from one look. Whereas a traditional gym program, that's more difficult sometimes because you're doing exercises that somebody told you are good for golf but you can't make the connection in your head. Well, how is this helping me? So, uh, you know, we've been fortunate. I mean, our timing was good. The program is good. And we've been able to travel a lot and, and teach a lot of coaches how to do what we're doing and show a lot of golfers, you know, build a big community of golfers that love to train this way. And really that's what we're looking for. We want to build a community, uh, of as many golfers as we can, you know, throughout the world, even who like to train this way and who understand, yeah, these patterns, this is what I need. Yeah. It, what's really cool. You mentioned the community. I posted something just on Instagram the other day with me swinging one of the, the tools and I got, I got pinged by a couple people like, Oh, I have, I have that one or, you know, you're doing the Mach three and, you know, so people definitely recognize it. it obviously they're very recognizable tools too. And, mm -hmm. you know, so let's dive into a little bit of, of, of what the tools are like and, and just kind of what the, the basis behind the system is. Cause I think a lot of people, when they hear speed training, they think overspeed, underspeed training. They think swinging, you know, the super speed sticks, the stack, those kind of programs. But this is way different than than anything like that. Yeah, we're we're not an overspeed program. We have one tool that we swing as fast as possible. It's called a jet stick. Yeah, it's designed to be very easy on your body. You do swing it a lot at top speed, but I'm going to say that's five percent of Mach three. All of the other tools are what I would call strength and relevant patterns. So in other words, we're trying to make sure that we're, that no matter where we can move in the swing, we have strength and that we are expressing that strength in a certain way so that we can speed up without it being hard on the body. We will never ask anyone to swing harder because usually that involves using your energy inefficiently. And so it's, um, it's a matter of, you, you have to know that swinging as hard as you can is actually not the way to go. So if we call that exertion, we're not chasing exertion, we're chasing efficiency. And if you do happen to have an insight into the world of even professional long drive now, that's what they're doing. They're actually gravitating to that where they're, they understand we can do this through efficiency. 
and therefore we can be safer about it than if we're just out there swinging as hard as we can all the time. That's a huge piece because speed training, you know, swinging as fast as you can. I get a lot of questions on whether that's good for you injury wise. And, you know, many people have had issues with trying to swing as fast as they can because they're doing exactly what you talk about. They're swinging as hard as they possibly can. Right. So how do we how do we go about searching for that efficiency? And obviously you guys have an answer for this with the Mach 3 system, but what is it or what ways can you go about swinging more efficiently, efficiently as opposed to just getting up there and trying to rip as hard as you can? What is it about the tools that you guys have designed? And even, you know, how did you decide to, to build some of these tools that allow you to do that? Yeah, so it really boils down to how you use your energy. And the thing you have to remember is that purposeful movement, like a golf swing, it's something you're doing on purpose. It's not like if you were behind me and you screamed, hey, Mike, look out, you know, and I flinched, that's reactive movement. But I already know with a golf club what I'm going to do, what I'm about to do, which is swing it and hit a shot. So that type of movement is driven by its destination. You're moving the way you do because you're going to a certain place, and in this case, the finish of the swing. So what we want to do is orient all our body movements to the finish. The ball is not the finish. It's not, the, it's not the finish line and it's not even the starting line. So you could think about it, the starting line as I maximize my energy is, let's call it a foot or two past the ball. And then the finish line is close to the actual finish of the swing. So what you're actually doing, you're trying to maximize your speed past the ball out in front. We call it speed out in front. That's your intention, and it's all about your intention. We can measure anything we want. In the golf swing, now there's a thousand things you can measure, and there's a thousand things you can observe. But that doesn't mean you you should try to teach somebody to do those things. They're things that happen. So we're going to say, okay, how do we make maximum speed happen at the ball? And the answer is we orient the movements way past the ball. Because it, you're going to maximize your speed sooner than you're trying to do it. So if I'm trying to do it at the ball, it's going to happen in transition somewhere. It's going to happen before the club head gets to the ball. If I'm trying to do it way past the ball, it's going to happen somewhere near the ball. And so it's very simple, really. It's let's say I tell you, you only have one bolt of energy that you're going to send. Where are you going to send it? Yet the best answer is toward the finish of the movement, not I'm going to smash it down toward the ball. So th in that case, you're basically going energy up into the backswing, energy down toward the ball, and then energy up again to the finish, like you can somehow turn a corner with it. But that's not efficient. You're going to have to labor to do that, but we don't want to labor. We want to actually feel easier. So I'm going to say, okay, the finish is forward, upward, and because I'm right-handed, a little bit to my left. So there's the direction of my energy, and I just want to go straight to it. I don't want to go up, down, up. I actually just want to go up, right? Forward, upward, and a little to my left, and, and that's efficiency. So in other words, once you tell me that, and I would hope that you would show me that as soon as I want to take up golf, I would hope the first thing you show me is the finish. Once I know that, I go, okay. I go to there, from there, to there, from there. That's my path. And so you're freeing me up because you're not encasing me in a cocoon of technicality that sometimes I can never escape, right? You can take somebody and teach them golf or the golf swing, let's say, at the age of 15 and wrap them in technicalities. And then 50 years later, they're 65 and they're still trying to figure out how to swing. So, so how does that happen? Because I learned, for example, how to drive a car in one day, maybe two. 
50 years to learn how to swing a golf club? No way. It's, it's almost not possible other than it actually happens. And so apparently it is possible. But I would hope you could teach me 99% of a golf swing in one day. Uh, so take any sports motion. Let's call it how to shoot a free throw. I want you to show me the finish first. Show me where to finish. Right cross in, in boxing. Show me where to finish. Cross court forehand in tennis. Show me where to finish. I will intuitively then get an awful lot of that movement. And really from there, the best way you can teach me is to reverse engineer it. In other words, put me at the finish, then pull me back, send me back to it, pull me away, send me back to it. I can, I can trace and feel the path that way and, it, and it's an efficient path. So compare that to you start me at the ball and then you start telling me every few inches or so where I need to be. And then you start telling me how to start going back in the other direction. And then you start trying to teach me piece by piece how to get to the finish. I can't process that in the same way as if you just put me at the finish and then pull me out of it and send me right back. I'll get that so fast, you won't believe it, right? So that's efficiency. And in other words, it's a lack of wasted motion. It's a lack of moves that I, for some reason, make, and then I have to undo them or find my way out of them, right? So, so to wrap that whole rambling discussion up, just show me the finish first. And, and you'll speed up my learning process by a gazillion. It's like the old Jerry Maguire, show me the finish, right? Yeah. <laughs> I love yeah. it. Show I me mean, the finish and then I'll make the money. Exactly. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I mean, I, and I've been guilty of this and continue to be, be guilty of this, hitting at the ball. You know, it's like you, you feel like hitting the ball is the end result where as soon as I started learning about you know, your system and really working with Casey to really kind of utilize some of the, the tools. It was like, oh man, that's, that's an eye opener. I, I'm curious when you guys have, you have so many of these clinics and you're teaching even so many professionals, what's the reaction when people do that for the first couple of times and they, they finally realize like, oh my gosh, I've kind of been doing this wrong the whole time. Yeah. It's not necessarily that they were doing it wrong but that they were doing it as they were, they were trying to do it as they were taught. And if it's not maximum, maximum efficiency, then there's a lot to overcome and there's a lot to sort through. And there's a lot to eventually, maybe you have to unlearn a lot of things that you were taught. So the, the reaction from golfers is mainly going to come in a first encounter when their speed goes up two or three or four or five miles an hour just from that concept. And that's really important. It's actually why we succeed because every golfer is gonna come into the gym or into a workshop with speed that they already have, but they're not accessing it. And so it's relatively simple to show them how to find that through the concept of speed out in front. You don't have to change their body to do that. And you have to be very careful about trying to change somebody's body, right? Especially Absolutely. a senior golfer, you know, like for example, we don't do any explosive training at all with senior golfers because we'll just explode their Achilles tendon or their rotator cuff or something, right? So we don't even go there, but we don't have to by showing them speed out in front, i.e. greater efficiency, they will speed up. And they won't get hurt because it's something that's already within them. So normally, if you, you get injured when you're subjected to an unexpected force, that's not going to happen when somebody just showed you how to get your focus and your energy out in front. You're using what you've already got. It's already there. So it's not like somebody says, hey, jump on this 36-inch box or... Uh, sprint with this parachute tied around your belt, you know, or, hey, flip this big tractor tire. Those are the things that hurt you because you've never done them. And the force, you're going to be completely unprepared for the force. So that's where a golfer gets excited is, wow, like, 
we did a 45 minute session and I already went up four miles an hour. Instructors uh, can be a little bit different in that they can see some of these tools and drills and go, wow, I've been trying to figure out for 20 years how to teach somebody that. And this guy just did it in 30 seconds. But it's just because it's it's intuitive. The tools are meant to be intuitive, meant for you to sense the path as a whole and not try to break it up into parts, not try to intellectualize it. So it's very feel-based and it it's easy. You know, I mean, there's nothing easier than uh, a tool that almost does the job for you because it's just designed to swing on a certain path and to feel like you can maximize it out in front. So it's a very easy way to go about it and it's not rocket science. If it was, I would have never thought about it. I can assure you that I would have never thought it up. So it, probably the message is that in the past speed was presented as uh, something almost unattainable. And certainly that if you were a young high school or collegiate athlete, you better not even try it or you're going to get hurt. You know, in our gym, the main contingent is really age 55 to 80. They make the best progress of anyone. And I think it's, you know, it's a beautiful thing because it does help them play better. But also they realize right away, hey, these guys aren't going to hurt us. They're not going to hurt me. Um, I don't have to worry about injury or hitting the ball sideways because they're teaching me efficiency and that's efficiency is accuracy also, you know? So that's why we've been very successful with that age group, which is my age group. And uh, it's why they keep coming back, you know, and they become part of the community because they know they're not going to get hurt. Well, I would imagine, you know, just the, the fact that the movements are so relevant to the game it, it gives them an actual purpose to, you know, we all know it, it's like pulling teeth trying to drag people into the gym to actually exercise and do the mobility drills and do the, the traditional strength training. And then, oh, here's how it's going to cross over to your golf game. But we got to do some of this to, to make it work for your golf swing, whereas this is kind of wrapping it all up. And I'd, I'd love for you to kind of describe some of the tools a little bit. I know there's several of them, but I, I want people to understand that this isn't like your, um, and I, I know this is kind of turning into an infomercial for, <laughs> for Mach, <laughs> Mach 3, um, but it's because I, I know a lot of people that, that really believe in the system, and I've already started to see some uh, some of the, the benefits myself, but it's not like a gimmicky, you know, like one little trick pony kind of a thing that you would buy on an infomercial. So, uh, and you'll you'll recognize this. In fact, if you go over to my Instagram page, you're going to start seeing some more of the tools on there. But mm -hmm. give us an idea of, of what some of these tools are like, and I really would love to understand where the heck you came up with the these different you know using the ropes and and using the jet sticks and that kind of stuff yeah so a jet stick is the main speed training tool that we have it's the only one that is swung as fast as possible it's a very very close derivative of a tool shown to me i'm gonna say 15 years ago by an instructor in hawaii named kelvin miyahira and uh, he had one tool that he called a speed chain. So it was a actual golf grip, but it had, I'm going to say 25 feet of chain attached to it. And he, that was his main tool, but he also, for a period of time, he had another tool that he called an NOS, which stood for neuromuscular overspeed. And so it was a and pretty much an actual golf shaft with, uh, a ball and chain, a short, a short length of chain on the end. And our tool is basically that with a couple of small tweaks to, to the design, but essentially the same as his tool. And so it's very easy on the body. It's very easy to swing fast out in front, but mainly it makes a sound. It makes a swishing sound. And all you have to do when you're training with that tool is make that sound out in front. That's it. You don't have to think about anything at all. So it feels good to swing it. You can let yourself be fast with it. 
and you can just train by the sound. And as I say, that's the only one that we swing as fast as we can. That's it. So we have another swinging tool called a speed bomber. It's heavier than a jet stick. The part you're holding is a stiff handle and then the far end flexes. And so it's that flexing action that uh, helps you load and unload. And so we use that for what I call strength along the entire arc. So in other words, I want to think of my swing as being strong everywhere. Like if you, if, if, if I was swinging and, and painting a stripe with my implement, I, I would just want to be strong all along that arc. And so those two tools are a good complement to each other. One is pure speed and one is strength along the arc. They can both fit in your golf bag. So we have them. That's what, you know, here in San Antonio, if you're playing the city courses, most of them don't have driving ranges. So we need some other way to warm up. And so we use those. So now beyond that, the thought process is this. I don't want to have, here's my 45 minute strength workout. And then over there is my 45 minute mobility workout. And then over there is my 45 minute of swing training. And then over there is my 45 minute of speed training. Cause that's, that's an awful lot to fit into a week when I also have to practice and play. So I want it all happening at the same time. So therein is the birth of the long rope tools, which they deliver basically the conditioning part and the workout part always in the pattern of the swing. And so now all of a sudden everything's getting done at the same time. And that's a huge thing for, especially for a competitive golfer, because let's face it really competitively, the driver to me is the most important club until you reach the distance threshold of your level. And after that, it's going to be wedges and short game, really, you know? Um, so ironically, speed training, the way we do it, lessens the amount by far of full shots that you need to hit on the range. And therefore, it enables you to mainly practice wedges and short game. So ironically, the way we're, we do it is, speed training and conditioning enables you to practice more short game. And we, you know, we have a couple of tour players, a uh, various level of tour that train in our gym. They actually, they have keys to the gym and they, uh, they figure out a lot of things on their own. I've learned a lot from them about my own tools because they're very intuitive about how to use them beyond the conditioning aspect. And, and they have 100% told me that they hardly even hit balls anymore on the range. They use our movement training and our tools to train the strike. Speed training is strike training. And as the strike improves, you get to a point where you're like, wow, I really don't need to be hitting 200 balls a day here. I can hit 20. And so both of them mainly practice from 80 yards and in, in their practice time. And that's really valuable, it, you know, because A, you don't have time to do everything, everything, everything all the time that you need to as a competitive golfer. So you got to focus on something. And what better to focus on than short game because your gym work is is giving you the long game to a large degree. And it's also, you know, it's taking away that, like you said, the time that they're spending on hitting a bunch of balls on the range. So really it's, it's also making it easier on their body too. Cause we all know how right. tough that can be, you know, especially when right. you're hitting off the mats or, you know, and you get guys having forearm issues and things like that. When, when your golfers come in and obviously with your background in, in posture and post rehab and, and training, obviously you guys most likely do some sort of uh, assessments on them, you know, maybe mobility screens, things like that. And are you, do you ever find issues where people here, okay, here's a guy, he needs to work on this kind of mobility where you do implement some specific things for him to work on on his own and then, you know, also put him in the training or is it all really combined into just those training sessions? 
Yeah, so the way I describe this, um, so I am TPI, uh, probably one of the first people to get certified way back when, just because I was working with Greg. Mm -hmm. So of course, when he created the system, I immediately took the fitness level and the, uh, the fitness track and the medical track. So back then, uh, and I also am certified in what's called the Agoscu method, which is a, a system of postural assessment. So I had a very complicated assessment process back then. Now it consists of two questions. Are you injured? And are you lying to me about being injured? <laughs> That's really what I want to know because we have a whole nother system called Rotex Motion that we use in every workout to balance the body and, and prevent injuries. If somebody is injured when they're trying to enter speed training, A, you're not gonna get faster. The cutoff, the shutoff mechanism is up here. You're, the, the way I describe it is your brain is smarter than you are. It won't let you project speed and force through an injured joint or even an immobile joint, right? So you're not going to succeed anyway, but you, you have to be healthy really before you start speed training. So that type of person, you know, I really want to know, like, don't lie to me. Are you hurt or are you healthy? And if they're not ready for speed training, then we can simply do Rotex motion and another system that we have called Mach 3 Sim until they're ready. But if you are healthy, the way we're doing speed training, you can do it right away. It doesn't require a perfect body. So by the way, when I, when I first became a GOSCU certified, I did 300 postural assessments in the span of about probably three months. Guess how many of those 300 had perfect posture and alignment? Oh, none ever. There was one. One girl had it had, was perfect. And that's not a very high percentage, wow. right? So you're never looking for perfection. Everybody is some sort of package of deviations and compensations, and it's fine as long as you can function well. So really, no matter what issues a person has, we're going to address them through Rotex motion anyway. So I don't have this big complicated assessment anymore other than I really want to know, are you hurt? And don't lie to me because they will lie because they want to speak sure. to me, you know? Uh, so that's really the way I look at it now. And, and I feel like I, I don't want to dwell on a person's small insufficiencies in the hopes that I can correct them into some kind of perfect model that that now can speed train because i already know that despite your insufficiencies you can gain two four six eight ten twelve miles an hour of speed because most of it you already have in you and the rest we can train for yeah so really it's a matter of are you hurt and don't lie about it i love that because we know that they're going to go play golf anyway right they're, mm -hmm. they're going to go swing a club might as well help them do that better more efficiently and, and right. help them, you know, with, with any of that. Um, I, I actually had on here to talk about some Rotex motion because we had Dr. Joe on back in episode 274. I'd love to, and, and people that want to know more detail about Rotex, go back and listen to that episode. But I'm curious how you guys use it. You said you use it in every session with all of your golfers. Yeah, every, every, every class or every individual session begins with Rotex motion. Uh, and that's going to take usually only five to 10 minutes. That's the way it's designed. In, in fact, when you're doing it at home, once you know the exercises, it would only take three or four minutes at a time. So say three or four minutes in the morning and three or four in the evening. So we start every class that way. Also, uh, Dr. Joe and I are, we're very good friends. And sometimes he comes here for a couple of days just to hang out and show us new stuff. Sometimes we go to Nashville and hang out and bother him there and he'll show us stuff. And so we're really realizing new ways that it can be used, almost like a superset pattern 
where you can do some drills or exercises and then a Rotex motion exercise and then go back to your drills so that you're just constantly balancing the body all the time. So it's a fabulous system, and, and I always say it's responsible for 50% of our success that we have with golfers. Dr. Joe will say, well, isn't it 51? <laughs> but uh, yeah. So, you know, he, to be honest, he and Greg are the two smartest people I've ever met in this business. They both have brains that work like warp speed computers and they never stop. Mm -hmm. So it was a huge bonus to me to be exposed to both of them at the time that I was. And I just, just luck. And I, and I, I rely, I don't see Greg that much, but I see Dr. Joe a lot and he has helped me and helped Mach 3 tremendously. So for those that are just hearing about Rotex right now, can you just give us a brief definite or ex explanation of what it does and, and why is it so important for you guys? How, how does it help, you know, kind of reset the body? Yeah. So the simplest way is it focuses a lot on internal hip rotation and external shoulder rotation. That's a very, very simplified way of describing it. Um, to take another step with that, it, it's geared toward releasing chronically tight muscles and activating and strengthening chronically weak or inhibited muscles. So it, you're, it's always striving to just balance the system of what is too tight, what is too weak. And it's really ingenious and it utilizes a principle of isometric tension. So let's say instead of doing 10 repetitions of an exercise, you were actually only doing one rep, but you're holding it for 10 seconds against a resistance. So that gives your brain time to wire together the muscles that are functioning as a unit and as a team to do that task. And so it just really is way more efficient than any other system I've ever come across. A Rotex kit consists of two foot platforms that you're standing on and one handheld device. And, uh, you know, when I first, he'll tell you this story differently, Dr. Joe will, but when he first showed it to me, and I'm going to say this has to be eight years ago now, I thought in my head, that's never going to work. He'll tell you that I said to him, <laughs> <laughs> it's never going to work. But what really happened is I thought it to myself, and then I later admitted to him that I thought it to myself. Uh, I would never say that to him, you know, out loud, but I thought it. That's not going to work. And then it didn't take but 10 minutes for me to understand, oh, yeah, this will work. You know, because uh, the saying is muscles that fire together wire together. And so each Rotex exercise, you are activating a team of muscles that work together to optimize your posture and to optimize the balance of your body. And really, it's, it's been a, a godsend to us because it gives us a way to address people's imbalances within uh, an eight-minute segment of a class. And so over time, that sh the configuration of the body improves and the recruitment of those muscles improves and it doesn't take a long time. It just takes, you got to know some basic exercises and just keep doing them. It's again, that whole concept of efficiency, right? Like mm -hmm. doing, doing the minimal but most maximally beneficial stuff that's going to get the most done in the shortest period of time. Something else yeah, that that's I... A, that's a challenge. That's a challenge with even people who are, you know, the first exposure to Mach 3, let's say, they go up six miles an hour in clubhead speed and eight miles an hour in ball speed. It's not that unusual. And so then I always say, okay, now look, you just proved that this concept works. So the question is, are you going to believe it or are you going to try to complicate it now by, well, what about this? What about that? And there's no what about. You just did it. 
You just showed yourself and you showed me that it works. So now you can either believe in it and let's make some real progress, or you can become the guy that in 2045 is still trying to figure out how to swing. Let's take a second to thank our partners over at Live Pure. You've probably heard me talk about Live Pure on the 18 Strong podcast before, and it is the hydration drink of choice around here. Whether you need to hydrate, whether you need to recover, or whether you need a little extra energy out on the golf course, the Live Pure nutrition packets are super simple to use. You just pop them open, dump them into your water, and you've got your hydration, your energy, your recovery for the golf course, for the gym, wherever it is. Maybe you're on a guy's trip, you need a little extra hydration, Live Pure has you covered. And I just found out that they have now taken the blue raspberry flavor and they put it in all three of the products, the hydrate, the recovery, and the energy. So we know we all love blue raspberry anything, whether it's blow pops or drinks or whatnot. Blue raspberry is always the preferred flavor of choice. And now they've listened to you guys you guys told them that was the best flavor, and they put it in every single one of their different packets. So go to livepure.com. That's L-I-V-P-U-R.com. You have a whole array of choices over there, different flavors, different packets, different types. The hydrate, the energy recovery based on what your need is for that specific day. So go there, livepure.com. Use the code 18STRONG, and you're going to get 15% off. Use livepure to champion your day. Another topic I want to touch on is I know that there's many of us out there that are still going to want to do some sort of strength training and whether that be not necessarily for their golf game just you know might be aesthetically might be the way they want to look it they just they it, it's part of their mental health how do you tie those together and how often do you recommend doing the Mach 3 speed training mm-hmm. and if it is somebody that is wanting to also do that stuff, uh, more traditional strength training, how, how do you have them blend those two? What, what's your advice there? Right. So we did, a, after one year of Mach 3, we looked at all our numbers to look at uh, the relationship of frequency and results. And it's a linear equation. It's never really changed much since then. The people that come consistently three times a week the average eventual gain in speed is 14 miles an hour. When it's twice a week, it's nine miles an hour. And when it's once a week, it's six miles an hour. And then if you keep taking it down from there, twice a month was four and once a month was one. So three times a week is the sweet spot. Now, keeping in mind the actual overspeed part is only minutes, like Whatever length of time it takes you to do three sets of six reps with a jet stick, that's the overspeed part. It's no time at all. It's two minutes, right? And the rest of it is just support. It's it's strength in the right patterns, and it's Rotex to keep the body balanced. So really what we're doing is a very minimal amount of, of true speed training, and a lot of efficiency and patterning training. Uh, The two pros I mentioned who train at our gym, they do a lot of drills at 10 and 20 and 30% of full speed. They just work the patterns and and they're intuitive about fine tuning the patterns to their own swing. So the big answer, three times a week speed training. Uh, We, classically only have one weight training exercise that is a part of Mach 3, and that is a hex bar deadlift off of the blocks. So a hex bar is something, it's a a hexagon shaped bar that you actually stand inside of, and it's a way of doing deadlifts and squats that's much easier on your spine. And uh, we learned from Justin James, who's a world long drive champion, to put the bar on blocks to avoid having to introduce the more dangerous part of the lift, which is down near the floor. So we'll raise that up anywhere from eight to to eight to 18 inches, I'm gonna say, so that we're in a much safer range. Now, not everybody does that exercise. You've gotta be built for it is what the way I describe it. 
Um, we have a girl that works for us and plays the Epson tour, Sarah White. She grew up playing hockey, ice hockey on the boys teams and her dad is a strength coach and she is built for weight training. She has the perfect body for it. So she, for her, I'm all for it. Go ahead and, and weight train as much as you want. There's a lot of high school girls and boys who are slender, unathletic, have taken up golf, but they don't have the body to withstand weight training. So it, it's not something that I say everybody has to do. Now, progressing one step from that though, these kids are gonna go to college, maybe on a, especially the girls, it's, it's easier for the girls to get a collegiate golf scholarship than the boys. You're gonna go to your new college and in all likelihood, they're gonna have you weight training possibly even like the football guy is training the golf team, right? So we do feel an obligation to get them ready for the lifts that they might encounter. And so, uh, especially this year, we have an entire summer camp dedicated to that, to introducing them to those lifts as well as speed training, but the lifts that they're likely to see, you know, because if you've never done a barbell squat, or a deadlift or a clean, you may find that they were wanting you to do that. And so you really, it pays ahead of time to learn the technique so that you don't get hurt. Um, I've lifted my whole life, you know, since let's call it age 14. So I still do weight training, but I'm not under the illusion that it helps me swing faster. Because to be honest, we've never been able to prove that. We tried, <laughs> you know, we had a whole one entire winter where everybody did a very well-designed weight training because I know what I'm doing when I design those programs and everybody got stronger and everybody felt great and everybody got slower. And in fact, a lot of them went back to their original speed. So I'm not knocking weight training, but we simply were not able to prove that it helped increase speed. Interesting. Now there's a lot of strength coaches that will tell you it does. And they'll go on and on and on about the theory behind it. But my question there is, and how many golfers have you tested this on? Because see, this is all I do. This is all we do all day, every day. So we've had in our gym alone 1900 golfers in five years wow plus all the ones around the country so i have a big sample size for you to prove that weight training improves swing speed you're going to have to eliminate pretty much the other things the golfer is doing and just do weight training for a certain amount of time or you can you can still do some speed training but you know, how many strength coaches work with golfers day after day after day after day? So I'm not interested in theories. If you can prove it, prove it. And I enjoy weight training and I like to teach it. And I don't mind if somebody does it, but I'm not ready to say it helps you swing faster. Very, very interesting. And Obviously, you guys, this is one of the things that you talk about on your website is how much testing you do. In fact, you encourage your your participants, your golfers to test every time they do a session, correct? We do. We test speed at every single workout. So that's going to be, you know, one to three times a week. The reason we do that, well, first of all, when I teach a workshop, nothing comes out of my mouth that I haven't proven to myself beyond any doubt. So I'm only teaching what I know is true. And we know that by having them continually chasing the speed, that gets the best results. And it also keeps the body accustomed to speed training. Where I think it would be ineffective, so let's say we do a workshop and one of the instructors says, okay, this is great at my club, like the second Wednesday of every month, we're gonna do speed training this really probably not gonna work. You, you don't wanna mix your goals too much, if at all. So if you're interested in speed, the best thing to do is focus on it until you've got what you want. 
I feel like it's the most effective way to train all the time, keeping in mind that we're not over speed though, we're more efficiency speed. Uh, so if you look at somebody like say a Bryson DeChambeau who I don't know him, but why did he become the longest hitter on the tour, on the PGA tour? It's because he's the one that decided to do it. And he's the one that then chased it until he got it. And that's a huge thing. You, you know, you can't say, yeah, well, I'd, I'd like to hit it 30 yards further, but then you don't do anything to get that other than maybe try to swing harder. So you got to say to yourself, I am going to gain 10 miles an hour of ball speed and I am going to hit it 30 yards further. And I'm not going to worry too much about other things while I'm doing that. And, and that's the way you get results. So every single class, we hit five measured balls in the middle of the class halfway through and then another five to 10 at the end. So it's always 10 to 15 balls every single time. And it, it works great. I mean, everybody, you're not going to be, you're not going to be at your fastest every workout. Just like, let's say I'm a plus five handicap. I'm still, I'm not going to go out and shoot 65 every day, right? You're going to have slower days. You're going to have days when you can't go up. So we learn, okay, what are the different victories that we can get out of a session? We could go up in top club head speed, top ball speed, average club head speed, average ball speed, consistency of speed, control of speed. There's all kinds of things you can do to get yourself a win, even on a day when you really just aren't as fast as some other days. So it's a very big picture thing. In the beginning, you'll probably go up quickly and then you'll kind of start leveling out and eventually you'll reach your limit some, at some point. It's hard to tell when, it could be two months, it could be five years, you know? But what you're really looking for is two things, to gain distance with more speed effortlessly, and also to, to be able to have gears. And when I say gears, I mean, it's a feel thing, but you'll probably have a gear that you normally use when you're playing. But when you get an opportunity, you want to have a gear above that. And some people even have two gears above that. And then possibly you want to have a gear one down, right? So that you shift your, depending on the, the hole and the shot, you can shift your speed gears up and down. And then that transforms over to your irons and wedges too. So that now you've learned how to use speed to score because really if you're faster, who cares if you can't use it to shoot better scores? So you learn, okay, A, I'm going to get faster, and then B, I'm going to learn to use it to score better. That's the ultimate goal. I, I saw or heard you say in one of your videos, um, you know, regarding speed, top speed, average speed, that, that what you guys care more about average speed really than even what the what the top speed somebody has is. Can you explain why that's so important as opposed to everybody's chasing, you know, what's my top number? What's my top number? Yeah. Well, because basically your average is what you're going to use on the golf course. You know, your top speed, like I say, will probably make some nice leaps in the beginning and then it'll, it'll become more difficult to drive that up. So let's say in your very first session, you hit, five balls and let's say they're between 91 and 99. Okay. But 99 is your fastest. Now you train for a week or two and then you're being tested again and you do 397s and 298s. Well, you didn't reach 99, but you sure as hell had a better average than when you were all over the map. And that's mm -hmm. a big win. So now you say, okay, now my stock speed is like 98.5, or maybe before it was 94, even though I got to 99 before or whatever. So that's just an example. You want to be able to condense the numbers, be more consistent with the numbers, and even more importantly, 
If you say to me, Mike, give me exactly 80. So let's say my top speed's 100. You say, give me exactly 80. Now give me exactly 83. Now 86, now 89. If I'm a good player, I can come within one of any number you ask me. We've seen elite, not even elite, but just good players even who, who do the drill a couple times. And then they get a sense of, oh, I actually can do this. Um, and so you walk me up the ladder by threes, let's say, and now you get me to 98. And let's say I hit it 98 or 97 or 99. Now you say, give me 101. And because of the feels I've developed, I go, what, 101 or 102. So now my top speed has increased because you climbed me up the ladder of feels. And it's a really important drill. I mean, so really, once your top speed is leveling out, those are the kinds of things that you go to. How consistent can I be? Can I be consistently better than I used to be consistently better? You know, can I hit exact numbers or come really close? Because once you start doing that, then when you go to your wedges, you know, now you've got, okay, I'm going to hit this one 47 yards. I'm going to hit this one 51 yards. We hit this one 55 yards. And, and you can do it um, much better than before because you develop feels and you develop how much of me does it take to do this, right? And so that becomes the more important thing is, is the averages and the consistency and the control of it and your ability to use that when you play. I would imagine that when you're able to do that and, and you can kind of dial it into whatever number that is, that just goes to show that you're, you've, you've gotten out of your head with what technique piece is going to help you do that. That's when you know, like, this is, this is really getting grooved into my system. All I'm doing, like you said, is, is pressing the gas pedal a little bit more or lowering it down a little bit more. That's, that's when you know you got it. I saw that you guys are integrated with, uh, sports box you have sports mm -hmm. box on your your website so with with sports box explain what that is because that's a pretty cool new software that i don't think a lot of people even on this podcast have probably heard of but how are you guys using it yeah so it's an app uh and it enables you to measure body movement so traditionally in the simplest form you could take a face-on video of yourself hitting a driver and then you could look at the numbers, you know, torso turn, shoulder turn, uh, pelvic turn, and they're coming out with more and more uh, data points. Like right now you can measure hand speed, which is really interesting. Uh, in the future, I think hosel speed, which is more what we do. They should have already then had an update uh, to the app. And so if you go on there and click learning, the learning icon, then you'll see a Mach 3 program in there with workouts for Jet Stick, Speed Bomber, and a, a tool we have called a Velociraptor. So you could simply use the app to follow the workouts. And that learning center is going to be populated with more Mach 3 programs in the future. So basically, it's a, it's a very good app where you can measure body movement, and also you'll be able to do Mach 3 workouts simply by following the videos. So, it, and it gives you like a 3D model of your body, mm -hmm. right? Measures all it gives the gives you a 3D and... model, yeah. So, so interestingly enough, I don't do really any of that in, in Mach 3 classes or workouts or anything. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people, you know, that's a, something that they love to do. And once Hosel Speed is available on the Sportsbox app, then that's going to be a direct relationship to what we do in our gym in, in that you'll be able to measure your speed in, in every workout that you do. So you could go on and you could follow a Mach 3 workout and then you could video some swings and look at your Hosel Speed or anything else that you want. You know, I mean, other people obviously look at that more than I do in terms of what body segments are doing and so on. Um, especially the younger golfers really are, in, are into that. Uh, I will more partner with Sportsbox for programming, for giving people workouts to do on the app, to follow on the app. 
Okay, that's what I was wondering if it was if it was showing you like discrepancies in your sequencing or if, if you as the user as the golfer kind of have to know what you're looking at for those different things or does it diagnose and then kind of change change up your program or anything like that i didn't know if it was that sophisticated yeah, in the yet. future maybe you know, in the future maybe yes uh and it's it's a very i think going to be a popular app for instructors because it's very easy to use and very cost effective and so it'll, it will be a way if you, because Mach 3 tools can be used to teach the swing. I don't do that and we don't do it in our gym, but it can be done. And, and we actually, part of our certification program, we show instructors how to do that, but also any good golf instructor who learns Mach 3 will intuitively understand. They'll see a tool and a drill and they'll go, oh yeah, I got a guy who's steep over the top. That's going to be perfect. Or, yeah, I got a, uh, a guy that gets stuck in the downswing. That's going to be perfect, that kind of thing. So I think the instructors that get sports box uh, are going to, you know, the, the potential of it is unlimited for how we can partner with them. Uh, it's kind of mind boggling when I think about it, but a, a big part of my input will actually be literally workout programs to follow. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, regarding the, the, the tools regarding, you know, you working with so many different golfers, what do you see are some of the biggest, um, I guess, biggest issues that golfers have technique wise that are then kind of cleaned up when you start working with Mach 3 and maybe even you guys have mentioned, you know, power leaks, what are some of the, the big power leaks that people have, or what are some of the, the biggest swing faults that people show up with? Yeah. So the most obvious would be dumping your energy downward toward the ball. That's speed killer. So in other words, if we have 10, 10 good players in our gym and I say to them, what do your fastest swings feel like? They're going to say, like, I wasn't trying as hard or like the swing was over with before I realized anything about it, you know, so intuitive. If I say, what do your slowest swings feel like? They will all say the same thing. They'll say, I tried too hard too soon. So really what our tools are doing is enabling you to feel that you don't have to try as hard you simply have to allow yourself to be faster out in front. It's a different feeling than trying hard. It should feel easier. Biomechanically, with our tools, there's no way to swing them steep over the top. You can't. You could do it on purpose, but you'd only do it once and you'd never do it again. It would feel so horrible. You just, you'd know that it was wrong. So the tools basically work on what you would call a shallow from the inside path. And I think that's good because I, I think the more you analyze the swing, the more difficult it is to put it into practice. Whereas if you can just have something where you can sense the movement as a whole and then replicate the general feeling with your driver, it's, it's a lot easier. And you should be able to feel that it's faster because it's more efficient and because you're not making moves that don't make sense when related to the end of the swing. So you can, with swing, swing flaws are almost always because the movements are oriented to the ball. Just like if I were driving a race car around the curve, okay? Everything I do with my car around the curve should be because I want to exit the curve in a certain way. So I'm going to, or I'm going to jockey my car around there in a way that allows me to explode out the other end of the curve. I'm not going to orient the car to the middle of the curve. This is not where I'm going. Right? right. So the end, your intention of what the end is going to feel like, that drives the movement and that in fact creates the movement. The finish creates the move. So I've read sometimes, well, the finish is just a result of everything came, that came before it. 
The finish creates everything that came before it. It's a matter of intention, right? Absolutely. My intention is to drive my fist through the back of your head, somebody teaching me a right cross, that pretty much creates my move to a very large degree. So show me the finish first. Show me what you want me to be doing at the end, and then I'll get it. My son started mountain biking uh, a couple of years ago, and so I've had a chance to go out and ride on the trails with the with the coaches and and with the kids. And one of the things, one of the first things they teach them is when you're going into a turn, to to basically look up and out where you want to go. You don't ever look at the berm. And I believe me, I I did this wrong. And you all of a sudden you start to slow down. You start to break. You get worried about it's look where you're going. Your body naturally will help you get there, and you get there so much faster. And it's I know it's right. that's on a bike, but it's the same exact intention that you're talking about. It's actually exactly the same. It's a, that's a it's an analogy that we use in workshops is the racing curve. Mm-hmm. And ironically, we did a workshop in in Colorado at this beautiful club called uh, Roaring Fork. Yes. It's near Aspen. And as the class was just warming up before the workshop started, there was one guy, he wasn't hitting the ball well, and I came up and I said, I introduced myself, and I said, "Uh, what do you do? And he said, I'm a race car driver. And I said, what, really? And he said, yeah. And I said, all right. You're hired because about halfway through this workshop, I'm going to bring you up and I'm going to have you explain to the class how to drive a race car around a curve. And he did. And then I related that to, because we always use that analogy. I draw it on the ground with a stick. Here's the curve. Blah, blah, blah. Well, he explained it beautifully. And, I, and so it was a, a perfect matchup. I said, it's the same in the swing here. He's coming into the curve, but his mind is already at the end of the curve and everything he does with his car is oriented to the end. And it's the same in speed training and the same in the golf swing. So again, the ball is, the ball is not the finish line and it's not even the starting line. Yeah. That's awesome. I love it. All right, Mike. So, so for the folks listening, obviously if they're new to Mach 3, they don't have the tools yet. Um, I'd love to hear you tell us, if we were to start acquiring some of these tools, what's the first one that you would go with? And then also, if somebody doesn't have them, how can they start with you know just the concept right now? Mm-hmm. So if you're interested in speed, the jet stick would be the tool you need. If you wanted more of a swing workout, I'll call it the speed bomber. Now, normally I'll tell people, look, you need both. You want a speed bomber and a jet stick, speed and strength, strength and speed. Uh, If you have the space, then you can graduate to the long rope tools. Probably the most versatile of them would be the one we call a velociraptor because you do patterning and sequencing drills with it and also some conditioning work. So what happens anytime somebody buys a tool or tools from our website Within 12 hours, they're going to get an email that has an instructional video for each tool with all the drills. And they'll get a PDF that has sample workouts to follow. And so that will enable them to get going on their own. Um, Our YouTube channel, which is just Mach 3 Speed Training, probably we have about 35 videos on there just showing drills and discussing the concept and all of that. That's a good resource, too. We teach workshops all over the country. So on our website, which is Mach3SpeedTraining.com, if they click on the workshops tab, they'll see what's coming up. We have a, several of them coming up in the Dallas area, Dallas, Fort Worth, and in San Antonio. And, you know, we, we basically, we travel quite a bit. Uh, so... Those are the ways that you could get going. But mainly, if you just buy tools from the website, you're going to get instructions, video and PDF. Gotcha. And then, um, you know, one thing that that I saw on your website, have heard you talk about, is, you know, how long does how long does speed last? You know, and and what one of the coolest things that I saw was that 
you mentioned once you get this concept, this initial concept, you'll be faster forever, right? So you should be because it just came from a concept, right? So you're using the body that you have and applying the concept and it will be faster because it's more efficient. There's no reason why you should ever lose that unless you just say, I don't believe the concept anymore, right? And then beyond that, you can train and develop a foundation of strength in the right patterns that can enable you to, in, to find even more speed. But really, you know, we're not an explosive training program. It's all about the efficiency of motion, the economy of motion that the tools provide underlain by conditioning, just getting in better shape. And everything kind of pretty much looks like a golf swing or a close derivative. So you should always be able to say, yeah, I, I understand exactly why I'm doing that. Perfect. All right, Mike, I want to finish up just with some questions we ask everybody that comes on the show. Just have a little fun to, to finish off. So of the two probably most popular golf movies ever made, are you more of a Caddyshack or Happy Gilmore guy? Happy Gilmore because he was doing it for his mother. Very nice. You know? Yep. I just thought, I mean, that was a nice touch and it kept me more engaged. I, I think both movies are funny as hell, but I'd say Happy Gilmore. If you could pick a walk-up song to the first tee box, what's your walk-up song? Probably Under Pressure by David Bowie. Because I think I would feel I think I would feel a lot of pressure with a big gallery like surrounding me if it was like a Ryder Cup or something. Do you get out, get out and play much yourself? I try, and it's directly related to how much we're traveling, you know? Yeah. I actually don't play much in San Antonio. Um, I play more when we're traveling because secretly hoping that the club, you know, these really <laughs> nice clubs that we're yeah. teaching at a lot will say, hey, why don't you guys play tomorrow or whatever? So, so ironically, the more I travel, the more I play. Yeah. Awesome. If you could pick a dream foursome, who's going to be in your dream foursome? That's pretty easy. So I would say Harry Varden, Ted Ray, and Francis we met. They all played off for the U.S. Open in 1913. That's, I was just born way too late. So if, if I could have played golf back in the early 1900s, I, I think it I would love it. And uh, that was kind of the, the beginning of the popularity of golf in the United States was that playoff for the U.S. Open, which was basically won by an American caddy against the two best players in the world from overseas. So I'd want to be in that match. That was at the uh, Country Club of Brookline, was it not? Right, it was. All right. So if you if you were able to play golf with those gentlemen doesn't have to be with those those guys but uh, a bucket list course that if we said mike we're taking you anywhere you want to go pack your bags we're leaving today where are you picking i would say fly me to dublin because my friend gareth mcshay over there i would let him handle the courses and he would he knows me we would play persimmon and blades and he would take me to a bunch of hidden gems oh so you're yeah. de you're definitely going old school Definitely. Excellent. Is there a book that has really made an impact on you? Uh, doesn't have to be golf related, but that you have since then recommended or even bought as a gift to somebody else? Well, actually, I have this book uh, on my desk right now. It's called Breaking Out of Beginner Spanish. And I really think everybody should be able to speak three or four different languages. And I, I live in a city now that's 70% Hispanic. But I, I can't really speak. I can speak very elemental Spanish. So I made up my mind, all right, I'm going to pull my mind to this and become fluent in it. And um, I tried once already last year and discovered it's harder as an adult than as a kid. But I still want to do it. And I, I think that if everybody could speak more than their native language, uh, the world would be a much better place and people would get along much easier. So that's what I would say. I love that. I love that. And I'm, I'm the same. I, I don't speak a second language. My, my grandfather, his, his parents came over from Italy. And at the time, they didn't want 
to teach him Italian because they wanted him to be seen as an American. And now we're all right. like, oh, my gosh, I wish Grandpa would have known Italian. <laughs> We'd all be – and really right. that was the same on, on my mom's side too. All right, uh, we've been doing something new here on the 18 Strong Podcast where we're highlighting uh, other social media accounts, people that we love to follow or and would love to hear. Is there somebody that, that you personally follow – that you would also recommend the 18 strong audience go and check out? Uh, there, I, there's a lot, but I'll name one. I have a friend in Atlanta named Michael Cunningham and his Facebook account is Michael blade uh, because he loves to play old vintage blades, but he's an instructor at a, a, a club called sugar Creek outside of Atlanta. And, and this guy just gets it. He understands how to get kids to love the game. So mostly now, I mean, this is, is not a, um, I'm, I'm going to say it's his clientele would tend to be maybe more underprivileged kids or kids that normally would not play golf. And he has a way of drawing them in, teaching them in very simple terms, is able to develop them as good players, but really gets them to love it, has just a, a style of teaching that is very fun and very intuitive and really keeps them engaged. So Michael Blade, yeah, that, that Facebook account, he's really just, the guy just gets what the game is about. I love that. One more question here. Um, what's, and you can't say speed out front because I know that you'd probably say that, but what's the best piece of golf advice you've ever been given? Uh, so Joe Lacaz, who invented Rotex Motion, he has a way of speaking where when he says something, you just believe it. Like just the way that he talks, right? Like if he said the earth is a cube, you go, oh, yeah, the earth is a cube. So uh, one day I said, Dr. Joe, what is the secret to the golf swing? And he said, understand your own swing so that you don't have to rely on anyone else's interpretation of it. And, and that doesn't mean don't take lessons, but it means own it so that if you are taking lessons, you're contributing because you have an idea of what you're all about as a golfer. So, yeah, I just I've always remembered that. Understand your own swing. Excellent. Excellent words by Dr. Joe. Mike, what has you most excited about what's going on with Mach 3 and everything you guys are doing before we wrap up here? I have a, another friend in the instruction world, Jennifer Hudson, fabulous, fabulous teacher. She lives in Dallas, but travels a lot teaching her own program that's called Lifelong Golf and also teaches up at Sankety Head in the, in the summer. So we're doing a project together, a movement and mobility program, which people will be able to use as a warm up. Uh, or to teach group classes and she's a just a stupendous instructor and somebody they really like working with so we started on it actually last week um it'll take us until the fall to complete it but yeah so it, it'll be a, an entire movement slash mobility program excellent keep us posted on that and that way we can we can spread it and share the word for sure great Mike, I, I can't thank you enough for your time. I really, really love what you guys are doing. I love the concepts that you have brought to so many of the, the golf instructors and golfers, golf fitness professionals. And I hope that this kind of helps to continue to spread the word. I know you guys have been growing for the past several years and just want to continue to, to do that because it's such a, it's such a relieving uh, thought process going into learning to get better at not just golf, but fitness, strength. And I think that people listening to this are gonna, gonna be really relieved to hear like, there's a better, more efficient way to do it than, than many of us are making. Like you said, we, we tend to make things way more complicated than we need to. So thank you for taking the time to share this with us. Thank you, I appreciate it. I want to thank you for joining us this week on the 18 Strong Podcast with Mike Romatowski. If you want any more information on Mike or the Mach 3 speed training system, just go to 18strong.com and you're going to find Mike's episode at episode number 346. You're going to see a link to the Mach 3 speed training. And Mike was kind enough to give the 18 Strong audience a discount code 
of Speed 10. So if you're checking out any of their pieces of equipment, any of their tools, use Speed 10. We don't get, this is not an affiliate product. This is not anything that we're affiliated with. Uh, Mike was just generous enough to give you a 10% discount. So go over there, check it out. I've been using this stuff for the last several weeks, and I can tell you it's definitely making a difference in my swing, in my efficiency, and in my golf game. So go check out Mach 3 Speed Training and use the code SPEED10. All right, I want to thank you again for joining us this week. We've got a couple cool guests coming up on the show in the next several weeks, including a PGA Tour player that I won't mention his name just yet, but we've got a lot of great things coming here at 18 Strong, some major changes coming to 18 Strong in the next several months as well that I'll keep you posted on. All right, train hard, practice smart, and play better golf.